Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Na Maritime History uh, Virtual Lecture Series. I'm Fred Passman, and I'm the uh, commander of Continental Commandery Naval Order of the United States. Uh, before I get into this evening's program, I want to just uh, remind everybody about the Naval Order's mission, which is to preserve, promote, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's uh, maritime history uh, and heritage. You can learn more about the Naval Order at www.navalorder.org. You can see that in the streamer below. Continental Commandery was created in 2017 to meet the needs of Naval Order companions who can't participate in activities at geocentric locations. We've got wonderful commanderies in New York, San Francisco, and other cities uh, mostly on our sea coast. But we have uh, nearly 160 companions who live at substantial distances, and we created the Continental Commandery to serve your needs. Learn more about the Continental Commandery at the website in the banner streaming below. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items, one of which is that if you have questions as uh, uh, Jim Tritton is giving his presentation. Feel free to post them in the comments box on your screen. And then at the end of the formal presentation, we'll have a question and answer period during which I will be sharing your questions and asking uh, Dr. Tritton to respond to them. Um, with that, I will now introduce this evening's speaker. We've got a unique program this evening because we've got a sea tale. Um, Dr. James Tritton, Jim Tritton, retired after a 44-year career with the Department of Defense, including duty as a, a carrier-based naval aviator. He holds advanced degrees from the University of Southern California and formerly served as a faculty member uh, and National Security Affairs Department Chair at the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, beautiful Monterey. Um, Dr. Tritton's publications have won him 63 writing awards, including the Alfred Thayer Mahan Award from the Navy League of the United States. Uh, should I add parenthetically that uh, uh, John Parasecchio is uh, our um, uh, coordinator of these programs and also is the president of the Detroit chapter of the Navy League. Um, he's published 12 books and over 400 chapters, short stories, essays, articles, and government technical reports. Very prolific. Um, Dr. Tritton was a frequent speaker at many military arms control and international conferences, and has seen his work translated into Russian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. So without further ado, I want to welcome you, Jim. Uh, delighted that you could be with us this evening to uh, share this tale from when we were mo both much younger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Uh, I, I only operated in the North Sea as a civilian back in my days as a marine microbiologist. But, you know, between the North Sea and the North Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf on our side of the pond, you know, the waters just pile up and you know, on a beautiful day, you're going to have state four seas. Um, <laughs> and those beautiful days seem to be few and far between. Um, so let's go ahead and run kerfuffle over the Norwegian Sea. Jimmy, how you doing? Jack shook my hand. We were in Reno, Nevada, hotel meeting that a room that would serve as our reunion headquarters for the next three days. Whenever I hear Jack come into sight, he always says the same thing. Jimmy, how you doing? No one else that ever, that I know ever calls me Jimmy, but Jack always uses that diminutive for some reason. Not that I mind it. After all, that's what most people called me through high school. I cannot see Jack or hear his familiar voice call me Jimmy without thinking about one night 50 years ago in September 1972, a night that is seared into my brain forever. We both sit down. I give Jack 
a bottle of cold beer and go through the ritual of getting out my old dark navy blue flight uh, logbook and thumbing through the dried and yellowing pages. We do this every reunion. There it is, September the 26th. The line entry in the record written in red ink. A flight in a stoof, the unofficial name for an S2G tracker. Bureau number 152811, 5.8 hours of total flight time, four hours of nighttime, four hours of actual instrument conditions and an actual radar approach and landing in Bodo, Nor Bodo Norway. And it shows that Jack and I flew together on that fateful evening. Suddenly, suddenly I am no longer in a Reno hotel room, but instead north of the Arctic Circle over the Norwegian Sea in our twin-engine carrier-based Navy aircraft. Jimmy, let's climb up and get some altitude. As soon as I advanced the throttles, there were a series of loud bangs and milder pops, then the cockpit filled with flashes of light, white smoke, and the smell of burned aviation gasoline and oil. I looked at the red-lit gauges in the dark cockpit and saw that the port engine tachometer was falling off, showing that it was not developing full power. I instinctively throttled back on the left engine until the popping stopped and turned the aircraft east towards the nearest land and a safe, long runway ashore. Jack, I'm headed to the beach. Jack, sitting in the right seat as co-pilot, was a lieutenant commander. He was both one grade senior to me in rank and actually the pilot in command of the flight. That meant that Jack would be making all official decisions. Although both of us were fully qualified aircraft commanders, we'd been scheduled together so that Jack could conduct my annual instrument check. I was sitting in the left seat and performing first pilot duties while Jack in the right seat functioned as co-pilot, although he was really in charge. Jack and I had known each other for years and normally got along without any problems. But he was the boss, and we both knew it. Jack radioed USS Intrepid, CVS-11. We've got a rough-running port engine, and we're headed to the beach. After a slight pause, the air controller replied, That's a negative. Return to the ship for landing. Your signal is Charlie 30. Indicating that we should expect to land in about 30 minutes. Despite my instincts and with no order from Jack, I turned back in the rain and the dark towards the west and the aircraft carrier. We were given radar vectors and then told, to hold until the flight deck was cleared of other aircraft so that we could make a landing. New and even louder bangs and pops filled our eardrums and the cockpit once again filled with flashes of light, acrid smells and white smoke. Both of us flinched in our seats and involuntarily took in sudden breaths. Then without any actions by either of us, one tremendous bang caused the whole aircraft to shudder as yellow and red flames shot out the front of the port engine through the slowly rotating propeller. Shit! Shit! We both said as we looked out the left side. I pulled back and to the right on the controls as the aircraft pitched down and yawed to the left. Engine sounds diminished and the blue flames out of the exhaust stacks died completely. Our speed slowed and the altimeter began to unwind. I increased rudder pressure on the right foot pedal as the aircraft's remaining engine responded to my throttle movements forward to generate more power that would keep us in the air. Jack, we've lost number one, and I've got to feather it. Since Jack was legally in charge, I did not automatically feather the propeller, but instead informed him that is what we needed to do while I awaited his concurrence. Making a decision to feather a windmilling propeller, propeller attached to a dead engine was a no-brainer. Without moving the propeller blades into streamlined positions and reducing the drag, we would descend and eventually hit the water. Per standard operating procedures, Jack and I both agreed on which of the two engines was causing the problem and which overhead button would cause the dead prop to feather. I pushed the correct left red feather button causing the three propeller blades to align themselves with the wind stream so that we could maintain altitude and airspeed despite the loss of port engine power. Jack, we really ought to go to the beach. 
beach, the universal term used by sailors to refer to anywhere ashore. I didn't think there were any actual sandy beaches along the treacherous Norwegian coastline. Without waiting, waiting for a reply, I turned the yoke to bank the aircraft again the second time toward the east. We had taken off from the ship a little over an hour before. When our stoop was catapulted into the air, the 872-foot long gray aircraft carrier had been pitching and rolling with white foam coming over the bow. The gale winds were so strong that white foam and spray hit the aircraft parked behind the island amidships, more than a football field in length aft of the bow. We also knew that after takeoff, the sun had set and a cold front had moved in, further agitating the ocean. Steady rain now obscured the moon and stars. Outside of the cockpit, everything was gray. There was no way to assess the air and sea boundary. Jack radioed the ship. We've lost the port engine and we're headed to the beach. The ship replied with a simple acknowledgement. Roger. Roger. I jettisoned the aircraft's anti-submarine warfare ordinance to lighten the plane and calculated roughly how long it would take us to get to the nearest divert field, Bowdoin, Norway, about two and a half hours east with a tailwind. The ship then radioed, Request you return. You signal Charlie upon arrival. Not a direct order, but clearly what they wanted. Come back to the ship and land here. I looked at Jack and I knew what he was thinking. We were scheduled to finish our major multinational naval exercise in the morning, and the ship was due in England the following evening. Having a broken plane stuck in Norway would prove to be a bit of a logistical and maintenance problem with the rest of the air wing a thousand miles away. Jack was one of the senior department heads in our squadron. He wanted to get back to the, to the ship and do things that senior officers always feel they need to do in person. Jimmy. We need to go back to the ship. Again, not a direct order, but close enough. I saw him looking at me and I knew he meant it. I banked the aircraft again to the west and we closed the distance to the carrier, now about a half an hour away. Instead of listening to his every word, all I could think about was how tough it was going to be to land our plane with only one working engine on board, a heaving deck, in a gale, and in the pitch dark. Jack added, Jimmy. I really want to get back aboard tonight. On the other hand, I was flying the plane, and I was very skeptical of this course of action. I considered my words carefully as I responded. Jack, if you really want to land this broke-ass airplane aboard the ship tonight, get into the left seat and do it yourself. Probably not the most diplomatic way to speak to a senior officer who would control my career with remarks that he made later about my conduct on this flight. Before he could reply, I put my finger on the radio transmit button and asked the ship to let me talk to one of the landing signal officers, LSOs. These were my fellow pilots trained to help during the final stages of a landing at sea. To my relief, one of my fellow junior officers and a good friend came on the radio. I asked him directly, Paddles, that's the universal call sign for the LSO, how's the deck? I knew I could count on him to describe the actual conditions of the sea and the pitching and the rolling of the deck at that moment without any editing from the senior officers who were listening to the radio chatter and obviously providing him with what they thought ought to be his answer. Then came an abnormally long pose before paddles in a very crisp and abnormal monotone answer came through our helmets' earphones. Smooth as glass. Bullshit! Bullshit. Both Jack and I exclaimed without hitting the transmit button. There was no way in the world that the Norwegian Sea had gone from gale conditions in a few hours to smooth as glass. Those were probably the words from some senior officer, a heavy, on board the ship, advising the LSO junior officer what he should say. Not those exact words, but suggesting the LSO tell us that conditions were good enough to get on board. By transmitting smooth as glass the LSO sent us a message that those words were not his. Jimmy, you're right. Let's go to the beach. There's no way that ship is not rocking and rolling in this weather. 
I smiled and turned the aircraft again to the east in an airfield that was not bobbing up and down in a storm. Before you take off on a carrier, the pilots are briefed in the direction and distance to the nearest divert field, just in case. We knew that was Boda, Norway, and they would be remaining in an operational status while there was any chance that one of the aircraft participating in the NATO exercise might need to land ashore. To transit over the Norwegian Sea from where we got airborne on Intrepid to Boda was going to take two and a half more hours. If we lost the one remaining engine or something else happened during that flight that would cause us to go into the water meant certain death. There were no ships along the way to come to our aid. If we even survived a water crash, we would undoubtedly die from exposure within minutes. Not a great course of action, but better, I thought, than trying to land on a pitching deck in a storm at night with less than complete control of the aircraft. On the other hand, if we went into the water trying to land aboard Intrepid, there were helicopters and escort surface ships to come to our aid and attempt to pluck us out of the freezing Norwegian Sea before hypothermia set in. Tough choice. Despite frequent continued calls from the ship's controllers, our squadron commander, and several other heavies to please come and at least try to land on the ship, we kept flying east. I sensed that if we tried to land on the ship, we would burn up so much fuel that we would no longer have enough avgas to fly ashore just in case things got even worse. Not a good situa situation. We were picked up by Norwegian military radar and got a steer to Buda. Our broken stoof droned on towards the rugged Norland coastline in the dark, the rain, and with only one engine keeping us in the air and out of the frigid, turbulent sea. The Norwegian controllers tried to keep up our spirits with occasional chatter about what to expect upon arrival. We learned that Buda only has one landing strip oriented roughly west from the sea to the east with jagged mountains to the north and further east. On final approach with runway lights visible, the Norwegian tower controller informed us, Boda has a rainstorms in all quadrants with winds gusting from variable directions, but generally from the west-northwest. That meant the winds would be behind and to the left of us when we touched down. A quick calculation revealed the crosswind that evening was outside the design specifications of our stoof. The book said we could not execute a safe, asymmetrical, single-engine landing with winds coming from the side of the dead engine. In addition, I would not be able to generate sufficient thrust with just the one good engine to get airborne again once we had touched down and if we then had another problem. Also, even if Jack and I both pushed on the right rudder pedal, would we be able to generate the muscle strength needed to manhandle the asymmetry of the one good engine? It was going to be a straight shot in from the west over the Norwegian Sea with only one chance at bringing this crippled bird safely down. Jack, this is not going to be pretty. Follow me on the controls and back me up. My stomach tightened and my jaws clenched. I lowered the landing gear at the last moment to not further exacerbate drag, making flight even more difficult. As I lined up on final approach with our landing light shining ahead through the rain, I could see the green runway threshold lights and the white striping on the tarmac at the approach end coming closer as we lowered down towards terra firma. The wheels touched down one at a time in the dark pavement, and the white runway lights on either side flashed by way too fast. The rear quartering wind pushed us down the runway more quickly than we wanted instead of a normal landing into the wind, which would have slowed us down. I throttled back to idle on the good starboard engine. I saw red overrun lights at the far end of the field rapidly approaching. The brakes had no effect on the rain-soaked tarmac as we thundered ahead, not slowing much. A sudden gust of wind from the north caught the tail. The plane weather-clocked violently to the left. Shit! We were going down a wet runway with the tires hydroplaning on top of the water but not gripping the surface. Worse, the tires were not rolling in the direction of our travel. The wheels were cocked about 45 degrees to the left of the direction of travel. As we skidded off the runway, I began to see distant blue taxi lights and nothing but blackness in front of me. Jimmy, you got this aircraft under control? 
I didn't reply. I was too damn busy stomping on the brakes, kicking rudder pedals, and bracing for a crash. Fortunately, it was either not our time or Jack and I had cashed in on some good karma. After leaving the runway and being enveloped in the darkness, the plane rolled over level dirt and wet grass, and we finally slowed to a very welcome stop. I cut the fuel and ignition to the starboard engine, and there were no mechanical sounds for the first time in hours. Jack and I sat there, immobile, speechless. Our flight suits were soaking wet, but we were alive. After what seemed like an eternity, I exited the aircraft on not too steady legs. Jack and I sat on the wet ground under the starboard wing and sucked in the welcome, clean, cold Norwegian mist. The sound of sirens from crash trucks grew louder as they closed our position, red lights flashing and deep-throated diesel engines racing. I looked up towards the tower. There was a Scandinavian airline system, SAS jetliner, on the airfield's parking area only a few hundred feet away from where we had ungracefully ceased moving, but on a direct path. The boarding ramp on the SAS jet was still down, and its engines did not appear to be running. Without saying a word, I got up, trotted over to the airliner, and walked up the ramp. Five minutes later, I slowly walked back to our broken-down aircraft and Jack, grinning widely with eight frosty, cold bottles of Tourberg beer. Well, Jack, is that the way you remember it? Jack shook his head and said, Jimmy. We only made the one turn back to the ship, and I always agreed with you that we should go to the beach. Bullshit, Jack. I insisted as we both laughed and drank a nice cold bottle of Tourberg to the memory of the LSO, who by telling us the sea was smooth as glass, was actually telling us there was no way in hell we were going to get aboard safely to the ship that night and that storm-ravaged Norwegian sea. The LSO had saved our asses. Epilogue. And now for the epilogue. Some weeks after Jim's return to the ship, he received the following citation from Commander Anti-Submarine Warfare Group 4 at an award ceremony held in their squadron ready room about, aboard the Intrepid. For outstanding performance of duty on 26 September 1972, as a carrier anti-submarine plane commander in the Air Submarine Anti-Submarine Squadron 27, while deployed aboard the USS Intrepid CVS-11 in the Norwegian Sea, while airborne on an anti-submarine mission exercise Strong Express, Lieutenant Tritton's aircraft experienced the power loss and subsequent failure of the port engine. Complicating this emergency situation was the fact that the weather and sea conditions were moderately severe, resulting in a diversion to a distant and unfamiliar landing field under conditions of darkness. Post-flight inspection of the failed engine revealed that Lieutenant Tritton's timely and correct securing of the engine had prevented further engine damage, allowing rapid repair and return of the aircraft to operational status within less than 36 hours. By his outstanding airmanship and superior technical knowledge, Lieutenant Tritton reflected great credit upon himself, his squadron, and the United States Naval Service. Signed, G.L. Castle, Rear Admiral, U.S. Navy, Commander, Anti-Submarine Warfare Group 4. So that concludes Jim's tale of a night of I would gather pucker factor eight or nine. <laughs> now, is it possible? 50 years ago. And um, with that, uh, there's actually a bit of a prologue. Because some months earlier, Jim, what happened aboard the uh, Intrepid? Sorry, you can put up the next slide. Four months earlier, we had just come back from a Mediterranean cruise, and we had about two weeks uh, before we were going to, uh, a couple of weeks before we we uh, were going to go back to sea to the North Atlantic. And my daughter was born right after I came back, and we got her christened before I left again to sea. 
In fact, she was christened on board Intrepid with the ship's bell and the ship's chaplain officiating. It, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's excellent. Um, so now we're going to move to the question and answer um, period. And uh, first question I have is about the, uh, the Sierra 2 Golf Tracker by Grumman. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the sensors you had aboard and, and then also a little bit about the uh, weaponry you had at your disposal? Sure. The S2 uh, came about in the 1950s, and it was designed as a replacement for two aircraft that had flown in, in uh, formation, one having some of the stuff and the other one having some more of the stuff. And they put it all in one package so that we could uh, fly off the ship or off the beach, and we could find um, submarines, and that would be using primarily, I hate to say it, but visual search found more submarines than anything else and acoustics. And generally passive acoustics means that we had a, an ear into the ocean and that would radio up to the aircraft and we could, we could process the sound and decide whether it was, uh, a, uh, uh, it was the kind of sound that would be uh, done from a submarine or, or anything. We would be able to recognize that. We had radar, we had something called sniffer, which was uh, a way that you could, uh, pick up the exhaust trail from a snorkeling submarine. We had electronics countermeasures uh, and a searchlight for visual search at, for visual, actually you're not searching with a searchlight, but at night, if you saw a, if you saw a very small thing on radar and you couldn't tell what it was, you'd light it off with a searchlight and then you could see it was probably a sailboat. <clears throat> the plane then, if it was, uh, if it was, uh, uh, wartime, we would have, uh, in addition to the ordnance that was used for search, we would have rockets, we would have depth charges, you'd have nuclear weapons uh, and the torpe acoustic torpedoes that would uh, search out and uh, destroy a submarine under the water. I may have missed something, but those are those are the ones that jump out at me. So John, I have a, I have have a question. Yeah, yeah, I have a question, uh, uh, Jim, uh, as a civilian, uh, I'm struggling a little bit with these almost orders that you're getting from Jack, from the ship, you know, kind of please come home and I really want to get back to the ship. Uh, yeah. How would you manage that? Not very well, obviously. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, that put, and that's the essence of the story is the kerfuffle not only between the ship and us, but between Jack and me. And it, uh, it was, it was tough. I mean, I knew he was in charge, but I did not want to land aboard the ship. And so my ultimate was, uh, you want to do it, you do it. And he did right. not want to do it either. So yeah, it, it, most people think that the military is very regimented and, you know, orders are given and, everybody follows them. And, you know, it, it's not, it's more subtle than that. There's an awful lot of give. Now that may not be on the bridge, but otherwise there's an awful lot of this give and take where you're, it's suggested and you know, damn well, that's what they want you to do, but they want it to be your idea. <laughs> My idea was to land and live, there land you go. aboard the beach, go so, ashore. So, uh, Jim, you know that the intrepid now is a museum ship, uh, and also home of the um, Medal of Honor uh, Club. I guess you can call it a club. They're at uh, 42nd Street Pier in right. the beautiful uh, Midtown Manhattan. Uh, so uh, Captain Jeff uh, Subco has this question. Have you ever had a chance to share your uh, tale of the night of the, uh, in 1972 with visitors to the, to the Intrepid? In New York City. No, no, I haven't. I've I've published it. It was and that was what gave me the thought of reading it to, to this group today. It was just published in, in an anthology that's uh, done by Red Penguin Books and uh, in uh, Long Island, and <clears throat> called Tales from the Sea. And I had submitted it, and it was there. But that I'd have to do a little bit of research to find out how I would get that story to where it could be shared with the, uh, the people on the, you know, who visit the Intrepid. 
I lived on that ship for, for, you know, a couple of cruises, a couple of years. Um, I was told, I haven't been on it since I left the last time uh, in Quonset Point, Rhode Island. I was told that my stateroom is, which was right underneath the quarter deck, one deck down, still has a yellow painted door with a squadron seal on it and my name. Okay. I, you know, I was last there in 1986, took my daughter for a tour of the ship. Um, and, uh, I can't say that I can recall one way or the other. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Captain Subco has a second question. Uh, how do you feel about the call to require the S3, retire the S3? Uh, and have you, did you have a chance to compare its capabilities with that of its success to the Viking? Yes, I actually, uh, I flew the S2 initially, and then uh, when the S2s were retired, I transitioned to jets and I flew in uh, in VS-22, uh, which was uh, an S3 squadron with the S3 Viking, and it was at a Cecil Field. Now, that was the S3A, and I've talked to a number of people about um, new versions of old equipment, and I'll tell you the truth. The S3, when it came out, when it came out initially, could not do nearly as good a job of doing ASW as I did in that S2G. And it was if it, and that meant I didn't care whether it was co the computers, you know, that you had in the S2. They didn't work all the time in the beginning, in the beginning. And so we would often be writing the sauna buoy fields and, and putting things on the windscreen. And that, that's how we were doing ASW. But we had some features that were missing from the uh, the S3 when it first came out. They fixed all this stuff later, but I flew when it first came out. So you didn't have an OTPI, which means if I needed to go back and find a sauna buoy to mark on top of it before I did something else, which would be normal, I, I had no way to get there except what the computer thought was the position of the sauna buoy and a it usually wasn't exactly right. The other big defect was that the ESM was not fully developed and we couldn't tell the difference between a submarine radar and a, a radar from a surface ship, a, a particular series. But it, it made it very difficult because then if you, got a, if you got lit up, you didn't know who was lighting you up. And so you, should you take it seriously or not? And there mm. were a number of other features that were, were very common. The, the, the computers didn't work very well in the beginning. They would frequently die after the cat shot. And, but the S3 went on to become an extremely valuable tool for the, uh, for the air wing and for the uh, task group. And you don't have that capability now. They, they wished away, they being decision makers who needed to figure out what to do with limited resources. They wished away the anti-submarine warfare problem and put all their money into uh, land-based aircraft, which, which work. That does work. There's nothing wrong with that. We frequently flew and had P2s and P3s and uh, NATO aircraft uh, in support of the carrier. Uh, and so you can, you can do ASW without S3s or S2s on board, but it just wasn't, it wasn't quite the same. When, you know, when I was on Intrepid, it was a dedicated ASW carrier. Although we did have, I think for that cruise too, in the Mediterranean, I know we did, they, uh, they put a bunch of A4s on board and called us a CBA again. So, you know, uh, those of us who are tin can sailors often think of um, the carriers being sure duty afloat uh, <laughs> in terms of their sea handling. But, you know, when we think about it, uh, even if you're only taking a five degree roll, if you're 70 feet above the sea, five degrees is a lot more than it is when you're 10 feet above the sea. That's true. Um, so what was... Uh, landing on a carrier in the North Sea, in the Norwegian Sea, typically like, you know, the weather there, I don't think it, often, you know, maybe five days a year, you see sea states less than five. And right. for those who don't know, sea state five, you're, you're looking at six to 12 foot waves and stiff winds, um, if not heavy winds. Um, and so you, you certainly have significant, uh, troughs between the waves. Uh, the waves are often confused. Um, the seas, you know, the wind is constantly shifting. So tell us about what it's like to catch that trap on a carrier in the Norwegian Sea. 
under best of conditions. Oh, under best of conditions, it beats anything at, at Disneyland. It's just <laughs> a hell of a lot of fun, and uh, the cat shot is great, uh, except at night, in which case it's terrifying. And <laughs> landing aboard in the daytime, I mean, by the time I retired, I was able to do that with, without having to think very hard about it. It was, it was second nature to me. But uh, landing aboard at night in bad weather, let me give you a couple of illustrations. I have been on Intrepid with my uh, aircraft parked on the elevator to the starboard side aft of the island. And I have had waves from the bow hit my airplane. That's a lot of turbulence. Lot on, of that, on that one particular day, my rear end was over the water and I had started up both engines and they had just broken me down when the whole ship tilted and I started sliding off <laughs> and I had to add takeoff power just to stay on the flight deck. Okay. So that's somewhat of a description of what it's like to be on the deck when you're doing all this. Now talking about the landing, I'll admit it. I went around eight times, eight times before I finally got shot out of the sky and landed. It was that bad. It was so bad that I had a, a rider from the, uh, the rag squadron with me in the right seat. Good guy, but he wasn't qualified in my squadron. He was only out there to watch us. And after about the sixth time, he said, you want me to give it a try? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and and sometimes it was my fault. Sometimes the ship moved at the last minute. And there's it was nobody's fault. It just was. Uh, I boltered. I did. I finally caught a wire and just uh, total absolute relief, which is what you'd normally feel. But after you've tried to do it, and it's the eighth time before the hook catches the wire. That's a hell of a lot different than just landing it the first time. And, yeah, okay. Whew, boy, I'm glad that's over. I was really glad that's over. And I went searching for the flight surgeon for medicinal alcohol. <laughs> it sounds like you uh, spent a lot of time doing playing guard off the uh, Southern California op areas where folks that had been on shore duty for a prolonged period uh, redid their carrier quals before heading off to Westpac. Right. And, you know, spend even more time oh, on the other side of the pond. And I think the, the tension in the SoCal op areas was 10 times greater than the tension we ever encountered listening to the uh, um, air controller and the pilots uh, as the pilots would make their approach. Uh, you know, it's a person that hasn't been in a plane for two, three years might as well be going back to Pensacola for, for flight training. So, <laughs> Maybe so that's building, a little bit harsh. Yeah, so so building on that, uh, the fact your uh, your old cabin still has your name on it, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to live on a carrier in that environment? Um, sure. I get the ter terrifying aspects of, of flying and landing. I mean, that seems, again, as a civilian, absolutely crazy uh landing on a postage stamp that's that's flopping all over the place in the sea but living day to day with your um fellow junior officers that one of whom saved as you said in the in the piece saved your ass uh i'm just curious about that quality of life well uh, an aircraft carrier is going to have five thousand or more people on board it's a city and everything that happens in a city of 5,000 people is going to happen on that ship. So there's going to be fires. There are going to be deaths. There's going to be people sick. There's going to be changes in the schedule. I can remember Thanksgiving. Uh, this was on Intrepid. Thanksgiving is canceled, and we'll have it next week because we have to do an unrep. So you, I, I loved it. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't trade my time in the Navy for anything. I loved it. I loved flying. And even going around eight times, you know, okay. Next day, I'm back up and you're flying again. It was a it was a great life, and those of us who were on it, we all had to get used to the differences. You know, you had to learn about a navy shower. And I'm sure that the navy showers were the same on on all the ships. Sixty seconds total water time, 
that sometimes we'd, we'd try to get a, a special dispensation because we were also told we couldn't smoke in the shower. Well, why would you say that? Because the fuel and the water were in the same tank. And sometimes as the water got down a little too, you know, that, that it got too close to that, that line where they mixed, you'd have av gas in the shower. So the joke was go to the, take a Navy shower and whatever you do, don't smoke. Food Wait was a second. Wait a second. Yes. Did they ever send you looking for the mail buoy? Um, you no, know, I sent people doing that. I had a guy <laughs> write that story up in the MOA uh, uh, magazine one time. But no, no, that's a that's a tr that's true. On, on the Intrepid, you had saltwater showers. No, freshwater. Because the, the fuel tanks were saltwater ballasted. This whole other story won't go into, but but it's hard to imagine that the showers were drawing from water that was used as ballast from the fuel tanks. The, don't know. That was too too technical. All I cared I, about I was where's where's the head. <laughs> Where's the wardroom? Where's the ready room? And how do I get to the flight deck to get right. off this son of a bitch? <laughs> I, I think somebody was giving you a C story on that. Uh, no smoke in the showers because the water was coming out of the fuel tank. That <laughs> You were going to talk about uh, the food. Uh, yeah, the food. We had it. We had the. Uh, I, I liked Intrepid. It was the best ship I had ever been. I was ever on at, at, at all of them. Uh, they, they, it was. Uh, we had a we had a good galley crew that that cooked our food. We had our our squadron stewards took care of. They were called stewards in those days. They weren't called whatever they're called today, which I'm sure is you know mess management specialists or something like that. But we had we had um, and I was the admin officer, so they all worked for me, and they took care of us. We had we had good food. Uh, of course, we had bug juice to drink, but you know we had good food, and we had it, it was a good we had good skippers. We had a, absolutely good crew. And we had a good time. Our, that squadron that I was in was the best squadron I'd ever been in. And we were recognized. We won every award you could win. And we were irreverent as far as when we went ashore. We just did all kinds of things that were just not permitted today. <laughs> and we, we had a good time, there. but we damn well did a good job. There you go. Um, Captain uh, Subco has a, a, a great, uh, he, during his first class midshipman cruise, he had the opportunity of being an exchange uh, um, sailor aboard the HMAS Melbourne. Right. Um, and he was wondering if you'd had any interaction with uh, uh, our Aussie friends, maybe not in the Norwegian Sea. Maybe. Did you ever get over to the Westpac or to the Pacific? I I did, but not flying S2s. So the answer is no, but we had Canadians. And we had Canadians on Intrepid, and we had Canadians in that squadron, and they were they were terrific. They were absolutely superb, and they come to all of our our reunions, and they were they were great people. The Australians also did good ASW with their S2s. One of my friends went down there and flew with them. So that's the only connection I have with the Australians in doing this. And of course, I was sick when all those S2s got they burned up. And they were all the old S2Gs. They were the best S2s that existed in the nation at that time. And they are, they're lost. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in answer to your question, uh, Jeff, uh, we had a fair amount of time seeming in formation with, with the Aussies. They were gracious. They were fun, and we were in port together. Boy, uh, the stories that we generated will stay where we generated them. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so could you? Very talk, professional, very hardworking people. Clearly, clearly, in that uh, area of operation, um, there were Soviet submarines. Uh, oh yes. Sure. Yeah. And could could you kind of describe uh, any uh, example of where you know you were? you found one and you were watching it. Yeah, uh, that happened. Uh, well, I wouldn't say frequently, but it didn't happen all that on off. It just, it happens a, a bit. And uh, if we were lucky, we got pictures. I still have pictures taken with my Navy cameras that uh, I took of, of Soviet submarines that were shadowing us. And, you know, it was, it was a game. They, they also had the, there was the trail, the trawler was there all the time and other surface ships from time to time. When I was on Essex, 
which was the ship I was on before Intrepid, and we were in the Norwegian Sea. We had a, a badger, a TU-16 badger, come out to uh, to look at us, and he crashed right there. Uh, he, he put a wing in the water, and you, if you look that up, and if you Google uh, TU-16 badger crash Norwegian Sea 1968, I think, yeah, uh, you'll you'll find it. There, there there's uh, some pictures on Facebook of the the smoke. Uh, I was sleeping in the Jo quarters, which was uh, underneath the the starboard catapult, and uh, we woke up with uh, general quarters. This is no drill. See, I don't see any other questions coming from the virtual audience. Uh, John, any more from you? So uh, just, you know, thinking more about, uh, you know, going to general quarters, um, in, in your view, was the um, anti-submarine uh, operation tempo, the tools you had, did you believe that if we were in a real shooting situation that we had the right uh, mix of people, equipment, and uh, command structure to be effective. We did. We no question in my mind. We did in those days. We had there was a tremendous amount of resources devoted to uh, anti-submarine warfare, not just by our country, but by the other NATO countries. And so we and we practiced it. And we were that's why we were out flying in the middle of the night. That's why that's why in the middle of the Atlantic I went around eight times because there was no divert field. We were too far away from land. We just did our jobs and we did it well. Excellent. Question came to mind. I forgot to ask earlier when you were talking about your uh, detection equipment. Did you have a magnetic anomaly device? See, I knew I'd forget. I'd forget one. Yeah. I, that I, wasn't I had a, to assume you did. Yeah. It, that wasn't a search. Uh, although I have to admit I've used it in search, but that was a localization uh, tool. So if you thought you had a submarine, it might not be a submarine because if you were just listening to the acoustics, you might not have a clear and an absolute clear idea for sure it was a submarine. So if you flew over a piece of ocean where there was no surface ship and you had your mad boom out, magnetic anomaly detector, it would light off if it was a submarine and then you knew. And then the next thing to do is to get into uh, an attack criteria pattern and uh, take them out. Excellent. We knew how to do that. We practiced everything from search to, to random, random mads. That's what it was called. You're flying over somewhere and you're not expecting to, to get a madman. And all of a sudden your mad lights off and there's no surface ship around. What do you do? I knew exactly what to do. Torpedo Bay is coming open and come around and get a, get a rough course so that you'd come up his stern and drop a torpedo on him. So that calls to mind all that training, all that exercise. And, you know, those of us on surface combatants were pretty much spending a considerable amount of our exercise time doing ASW. Right. Um, the Berlin Wall comes down. The Cold War is over. The end of history is upon us. <laughs> um, and somebody at higher pay grades than either of us was at, decided that there's no longer a submarine threat. Right. Despite now, instead of two nations having most of the inventory, the inventory being sold to various third world countries, and now you have just about everybody and his brother and sister has two or three submarines, mostly diesel, but some nukes, without any history of submarine operations or law of the sea. How do you feel about that? Well, I'll tell you what, honest to God, when I stopped working after those 44 years of working for the federal government, I turned all of that stuff off. I used to give lectures in foreign countries and to our country about strategy, doctrine, history, but the, I just I left it all behind, and now I now I write, and I primarily write fiction. Okay. And I I leave all of those questions that have no good answers, 
to those who have followed me along and taken my place. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Well, again, Jim, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's a great sea tale. Uh, you know, there, there was one or two days during our, our lives when you, you wonder if you're going to see the sunrise. And it sounds like this was one of those evenings for you. Let um, me give you a, a very quick epilogue. So fast forward about six or eight years, I'm on board in Independence. I'm the uh, staff oceanographer. I go ashore to um, Scotland and I'm in an officer's club bar and I'm sitting next to a guy and I looked at him. And I said, you look familiar. He said, we knew each other from Intrepid. And I said, oh, really? And then he told me the story about this one night where an S2 had taken off and couldn't get back aboard and was going back and forth between the beach and the ship. And he was the, uh, he was in, in the, the ATC and that wasn't the right word. I can't remember it anymore, but he yeah. was the guy on the other end of the radio. He was the, and he was telling me my story and yeah. I kept going, that was me. And he kept going, no, 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 it couldn't be you. And I'm, <laughs> I'm telling him all the things that we were doing. So this is one of these sea stories that you would normally expect to hear around the bar, playing dice and drinking beer, except it's true. There you go. Fascinating. Well, again, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, before we sign off for this evening, I want to um, share my excitement, not only about tonight's great presentation. This is the first time we've, we've had a chance to be the Continental Commander Reactors. John, thank you for your great job as um, uh, Jack. And I want to thank Mark in the background, who nobody can see, who does all this on-screen choreography for everybody. Next month, 19 January 2023, General Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., former Commandant of the Marine Corps and former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will be our guest. And the course of that program will be, it'll be an interview format. And I invite you all to join us again, 19 January 23, same bat time, same bat channel. It will be um, at 1900 Eastern Standard Time or GMT minus five or as we're now moving into a European focused UTC minus five. The Brits just love that one. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, again, a reminder, this will be available as a YouTube. Um, you can feel free to share the YouTube URL with your friends and acquaintances, uh, certainly within your commanderies. And the other thing I will share is that Continental is putting together a library of resources. So if you want to show any of our YouTubes to, um, let's say, the local uh, VFW or AMVETS or uh, other associations, please uh, uh, reach out to either me or to John, and we will set you up so that you can give those presentations. Uh, later in the year, I'll be sharing more via email on how to access the resources. Uh, lots of good kudos from our uh, attendees and uh, delighted to see them. And with that, I will uh, sign off for the evening and uh, thank you all for your uh, attendance this evening. Again, thanks to Jim, John, and to Mark, who is here but in the background. <laughs>